For those of you who have never met me before, I'm Sam McKegg and I'm the host of the CBC Saskatchewan News at 6. I literally was wearing this on the air 30 minutes ago. So you get the rush from one to the other. Uh, this is year, this is book 93. So year nine of the book club, which is crazy. For those of you who are new, where have you been? <laughs> And we oh, expect you to come back. Um, I would like to introduce you to Roxana Spicer, who is a former CBC journalist right. turned potential documentary maker, turned now best-selling author. Wow, I like the sound of that. Um, and I want to start from a place of why, what. Like I come from a family and, and you and I have talked about this a little bit through emails where um, I have a family history connected to World War II and the Holocaust in Poland. Um, and I've always been curious and I'm a journalist too, but I have not, I've certainly not gone to Poland and I've certainly not gone to Russia the, the umpteen times that you did. So what was it that made you want to dive so deeply into your mom's story? Uh, I think um, I think anybody who's been raised by a parent or parents who uh, who are secretive and seem to be tormented by something in their past, um, it, it creates a, a kind of longing and a kind of um, idea that if you knew what the secret was, if you could help them get over it that 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 life would be wonderful and joyous and uh, every, you would have you would be just like uh, the movie just like the tv series leave it to beaver or father knows best and i'm now i'm dating myself but i guess you probably figured out i'm i'm not a gen xer so uh <laughs> um i think to answer your question um the combination what really triggered enabled me to do the kind of research uh, that led to the book was this cataclysmic um, political event called the fall of the Soviet Union, which was basically a footnote in history for most of the people in the room, probably. But for in our little family on the number seven highway in Saskatchewan, this was a cataclysmic event um, because it meant for the first time in 50 years my mother had the possibility of going back to Russia to be reunited with her sister. Um, but for me, as a journalist, it not only enabled me to think that I might be able to take mom back to Russia, but it, the, the fall of the uh, Iron, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and then the 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 fall of the Soviet Union, enabled me to have access to documents and witnesses. And even the fact that I landed up in the only, um, standing on the roof of the only women's, first women's Nazi camp called Ravensbrück, north of uh, Berlin. The fact that I was able to do that was only possible because of the fall of the Berlin Wall. So it all kind of came together that way. When it happened though, did you, <laughs> It's all happening. And were you thinking opportunity or what was, what were those, what do you remember about those moments in your family? Oh God. Yeah. Um, I absolutely was thinking that the first thing that I did, the <laughs> first thing a journalist I... response is to think, <laughs> oh yeah, opportunity, not like the emotional of how this affects your family, but like, Ooh, I see an opportunity. Well, here. well, actually it was, it was, it's hard to say which came first. It's kind of like a chicken and egg thing, you know, Sam, but this, duality this you know journalist daughter conflict has been with me from the time that I was 10 or 11 years old but to come back to your question um I said to mom when well what actually happened and I don't want to give away too much of the book but I do have to share this they've story. all read it you can give away as much oh, okay as you then all right enough already no more teasing you okay I'm going to refer you back to the scene that actually opens the climatic last chapters of the book the Soviet Union fell apart. Um, history was unfolding on the CBC News every night. 
but um, it didn't really hit home in a literal sense until we, until my mother received a letter from um, Estonia. And um, the letter, she opened the letter and, or the envelope rather, and inside the envelope, there was no letter, but instead there was a photograph, a photograph that looked very much like this, mm -hmm. the whole, the whole photograph. And she, it, this was a photograph of herself taken immediately after the war uh, while she was in Amsterdam. And it was a photograph she sent to her own mother back in Russia to say, I survived, I'm alive. And I got that photograph eventually from my aunt. But the arrival of that letter and that photograph made mom very excited. She called me in Toronto and I said, well, mom, uh, you know, this is it. We we've got to go back to Russia. And um, her response was really floored me. I thought she really wanted to do this. And she said, why would you want to take me back? to the land of strangers and graveyards. So she really stopped me in my tracks. But several months later, she changed her mind. And then we did go back. So it was so the it was um, it was actually an emotional it was an emotional response to a very historic event. I felt that if I could reunite my mother with her sister, that she would finally be happy. So there, it was driven. I it, it it was driven by that. But at the same time, something else had happened, and that is that there was the invention of the tiny little um, handheld broadcast quality video camera, and this is twenty five years before the i i i iPad and all that. So I went and bought one of those cameras and I just, I resolved that I was going to um, shoot everything that moved on that trip and subsequent trips. When your mom is reunited with her sister, right? your mom's having one emotion. Yeah. You're having another. Right. What do you remember about that time and going back? It was, um, it's such a great question, Sam, because <clears throat> excuse me when I was standing <clears throat> when I this was after a two and a half day train ride from Moscow into the deepest reddest part of uh of Russia you know right into the Ural Mountains and um I was filming on that train trip and I asked mom permission if I could film the reunion and she said look just film the first part of it then put the camera down and forget it but um what actually happened was that on that platform, on the railway platform that my mother last stepped on as a teenager, um, I had to make a choice. Was I going to be the daughter being part of a reunion, a historic reunion in our family, this emotional uh, climax in my mother's life? Or was I going to be the journalist and step back and essentially give the platform to my mother and I decided, I knew that I was gonna do that, that I was gonna step back and not be part of it. Didn't go, you were I was there, it. no, I was there, but I stepped back. Sam, you wouldn't believe it. All the excitement on the railway platform, it took my relatives, all of them rushing around my mother like she was a rock star. It took them at least six minutes before they even noticed that I was there filming. Because I, all I did is I just said to myself, oh, please, God, please, please, please. Can I just hold the camera steady? Don't let, don't let me shake too much. Because I was, I, inside, I was, I was vibrating with emotion. Um, but I wanted to, I, I experienced that moment through the lens, through the lens. And my mother experienced that moment wrapped around, um, wrapped in the arms of her sister that she hadn't seen for half a century. Um, it's interesting you say that because the lens can put that emotional barrier there and allows you sometimes to have that, um, that non-emotional response. Because I think of that moment, I would be bawling. And this was also in a time where journalists showed no emotion. Like we're much more, I don't want to say we're like really emotional, but we're much more emotional now 
than we ever were um, historically speaking, because you were not to be biased, you were not to show emotion, you were just kind of a robot that took in things. But as time's gone on, people are realizing we're human beings. So for you to be able to like put that lens up and say, no, I'm just going to see what happens here, I imagine took a lot of restraint. Well, you, you actually hit on a couple of really interesting observations that I totally agree with you. Um, in the moment of holding the camera up to my face, it did create a kind of barrier between myself and what was actually happening. And uh, that wasn't the first time that happened. And anybody who's been out in the field will know exactly what that is. Um, uh, and I'm sure people who are in your audience are, can, can imagine, you know, when you have a camera in front of your face and you're taking a picture, you're there, but you're also removed. Um, so it was, uh, I, I wanted to be part of it emotionally, but I, I didn't experience the fullness of it in the way, obviously the way my mother did, because the camera was, as you very, uh, uh, adroitly pointed out acting as a barrier, but I get, I got to relive that moment, um, so many times after that, and actually the full emotional impact of that it really hit me the first time I played it back, which was, you know, a couple, you know, several weeks later, I realized the scene was perfect. It was, it was an incredible moment. And, um, and, it, and, and, uh, you know, that reunion between these two women on these two sisters on the wooden platform of the Chu Savoy ra railway station really represented the beginning of the 30 year journalistic investigation that led to the book the traitor's daughter in the same way so it was the beginning of the story for me as a journalist and in a way it was the resolution of another kind of story for my mother because in the weeks that followed she was able to finally resolve some of these huge questions that had been plaguing her her entire time in Canada essentially whatever happened to her mother. So the book is a mother daughter story on many different levels. And, and that's, and that's, uh, and that's just one of them. Um, when it comes to like your mom survived a lot, mm -hmm. didn't want to talk about a lot. I am familiar with people who don't want to talk about those things. Um, what in the end because you talk about when she died but in the end what was it that that she died from well you know despite the um the years of uh you know pretty hardcore um you know vodka drinking and uh <laughs> enjoying her pack of cigarettes you know my mother lived a pretty long life you know she lived mm -hmm. until she was 86. um so I, 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 you know, from a, on a physical level, that's, I think that, that all caught up with her, but, um, you know, I like to think that, um, somehow she continues to live on in the pages of the book mm -hmm. and that I have, uh, by capturing her story, I've, I've given her another kind of life and kind of, um, I've also given myself, my brothers, and and my our, our immediate family. I think a much more clearer, more visceral sense of who our mother actually was. Um, you know, mom was as you as you pointed out, she was very very reluctant to talk about any of this, and it took me a long time to realize that that she was protecting herself. That by talking about these difficult things, she was actually reliving them. But near the end of her life, in the very last interview that I did with her, when, you know, she, uh, and without any prompting from me, it was, it, I was shooting her 84th birthday in Calgary, Alberta, surrounded by family. And, uh, and she very spontaneously just turned at one point and said to me, you know, everybody has a right to know who their predecessors are. And this was a, Oh, this is an incredible. Um, it was it was kind of like she was she was giving her, her blessing to me doing whatever I was going to do with the footage after she, to quote her, departed the premises when she when she actually died. You know, um, 
So, yeah, no. You, do you think she would be, I'm sure she's proud of you, but do you think she'd be annoyed that you actually wrote a book? <laughs> oh, God. Because I kind of get the vibe that your mom would be annoyed that you wrote the book. Well, she might have been annoyed initially. <laughs> I think, okay, I think, first of all, my mother was a consummate book reader, mm -hmm. much like your audience in the library this evening and hopefully uh, joining us by Zoom and uh, around around the province. Um, she loved to read. I never saw her without a book uh, nearby. Um, I think that she would, I think if she had the opportunity to read the book, the first thing that would strike her would be the the context in which her own story took place. There's so much of what she lived through. Um, of course, she experienced it in a very here and now kind of way, but there was a huge historic context that she wouldn't have been aware of and that I've been mm -hmm. able to put together over these three decades of doing research. So, um, but the other thing is because she had come around to the idea that in fact, I did need to know for my own peace of mind. Um, I think the fact that she knew on some level that I was never really going to be free from her wartime ghosts, from Stalin, from Hitler, from these unnamed SS guards, these tormentors, these German soldiers, I was never gonna be free of that in my imagination until I put the last period on the last sentence in the last in the last paragraph of her life story, and um, and that was something that took me, you know, eight years to finish the book, and uh, I, th I think she, I think she would uh, she would certainly realize that. So she might have been a little bit annoyed, but I think she'd have a smoke and then have a a vodka, and then I think um, and then I think she'd dive into the book and think, wow, you know, this is. This is, this, is inter this is interesting, you know? I think that's the thing about World War II is we look back on it with so much historical context because we know exactly what was happening in every country at the same time. But at the time, the world was not as small as it is now. And okay. the communication is not what it is now. And so I think there'd probably be even things that she learned about that time that she was completely unaware of, which I think is so interesting. I want to talk to you about access because you got a lot of access. I had a lot of friends. You do. You have a lot of random, interestingly lingual friends who can speak the language and know the research. And so I'm wondering, did you do this research while also working at CBC? Or was this just you pulling strings and connections with people that you met over the years and something you kind of worked at off the side of your desk? Or how did you... Like it to all come together. Yeah. And to get into all of these archives, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even know that Adrian Arsenault could have access to some of these things these days. So I'm curious how you pulled off all of the access you got. Well, I'm going to have to send a memo to Adrian as soon as we hang up. No, don't wrap me <laughs> up. I mean, this is going to end up on YouTube. She'll no, hear no, it anyway. I'm, no, I'm but kidding. Your access, your access was phenomenal. Yeah. And just kidding about Adrian, but you know, I did produce her first long form documentary, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> I, um, it, it, well, I think um, I, I, I want to, I want to say like, like the song goes, I had a lot of help from my friends and, um, and I, I don't want to be too glib about this. No, no. Cause it, it's very serious. It, yeah. No, I think it, it really was a, it really was a case of of um, having a couple of people who were really interested in the story, who were professional historians, who were able to open doors for me and help me streamline my own questions and get me to the right person at the right time. And on that front, and I wish he was online with us right now, I met this guy, incredible um, a historian in Germany by the name of uh, Thomas Weber. And we've continued to be really great friends over the last um, 15 years. He's the guy who's kind of like in the background, like this kind of marionette uh, guy is saying, look, you got to talk to so-and-so in Germany. And I've got this friend who's, who knows a newspaper reporter in this town, talk to them and 
it, it was kind of a domino effect. Every time I was in trouble, like I was going down a wormhole, I'd say, Tom, what should I do? And he, he was the guy who really guided the research. So, um, so that was, imp it's important to have a friend in the right place. And he was that guy. Now, by coincidence, Tom Weber was born about two hours away from the little German town where my mother was held as a slave laborer in the last 13 months of the war in uh, Northwest Germany. So that was what really pulled him into the story when I was first doing my fundraising um, for to, to get back to Russia to do some filming. The It was the online um, pitch, if you will, that, that caught his eye. And then we started a, um, um, a communication that form the basis for a third for I guess a 15 year friendship but he he was intrigued by this story he took a personal interest in it and I just want to say to that um the book is the product of so much generosity and love from strangers in three continents I did interview in 10 countries over the last 30 years and um People who, I mean, I was surprised myself at some of the doors that I was able to open, but the story itself touched a nerve. It would, it's a mother's story. It's a daughter's story. Say, it's you trying to understand your mom. And yeah. I and I think that, that, you know, hold on people, right? Yeah. Like everybody's got a mom, right? So, <laughs> so I think that was, um, I, you know, I'd like to say it's because of my great investigative journalism skills, but I really think it was, it was, it was love. It was, it, it was kindness and of, of these, of, of empathic strangers in, in the right corners of the, of, of the world. And, um, you know, that, I mean, coincidentally with the, with the breakup of the Soviet Union and the fall of the, uh, the Iron Curtain that opened up access to archives that before that were completely, utterly off limits. Like consider for example, the world's largest repository of Nazi archives sits in central Germany in a little town called Bad Arlson. And for, um, I mean, I describe this in the book. I mean, there's enough paper in those archives to physically pave, um, the Saskatchewan Highway Number Seven for 15 miles. It, it's it's quite incredible, and um, but none of that paper was was available for researchers or professional archivists or, or historians until uh, into the into the 90s. You know, I mean, it was it was off limits when I first went to Germany in the mid 1980s as a kind of an experiment. If I should start to, you know, do a deep dive into Mom's story by going to Germany which I did uh, secretly. <laughs> I will retract my comment about Adrian because now I feel guilty because she probably could work the magic to get in there. But anyways. Oh, no, well, no, we, you and I are both great fans of Adrian. I, you know, yeah. she's, she's fantastic. Yeah. And, but this will end up on YouTube and then I'll look like a bad colleague. So this is me. No, no, Jeff. not at all. We'll, 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 we'll edit it. <laughs> um, did, what did Tom think of the book when it was done, given that he is such a historian? It was embarrassing. I, he said something like it was perfection, which of course yeah. it isn't. But um, uh, he hasn't seen it with the all the photographs in it, or I haven't, or I haven't heard from him yet because the book is pretty fresh off the uh, pr pretty fresh off the mark, and he's been traveling on his own international research. So I'm hoping to to get that feedback in the next uh, sh very short while. But but he did read one of the early one of the earlier drafts, which was quite close to to completion, and uh, he thought he thought I'd really really done it. Look, Sam, the hardest thing about the book um, in the later stages of the I'm just talking now as somebody mechanically was how was I going to integrate my mother's story with my story, and this harkens back to something that you said, I was also trained in that journalistic mold that you don't, in, you're not part of the story as a journalist. You keep your, keep your mitts off it. I mean, your job is to be the objective uh, set of eyes and ears looking 
looking down on the or, or looking at looking at the the story through these um, so called objective eyes. So I had to kind of disavow myself of all that training to to think. Oh God! I mean, how am I going to write this story without talking about how I got this information? And to that, I had I had the the incredibly talented, um, long suffering, fabulous Kim Eklund, another uh, Canadian author, um, who happens to live down the street, and we've become great friends over the years. And she volunteered to read three different drafts. And um, each time she was pushing me gradually, but steadily towards moving into the first person. Mm -hmm. Because the first three drafts, you know, I'm talking thousands of pages was, I, I mean, I wrote in the third person, like, you know, Agnes Spicer was like, not my mother. It was very strange, but I, I had to nail down that storyline before I could start to integrate my own. Do you feel satisfied with the finished product, knowing that there are still question marks? That is a brilliant question. Yes. Yes, I feel more than satisfied. I feel free. Do I you? Feel, I feel I feel free of history. I feel free of my mother's wartime ghosts for the first time in my life. Um, the fact that my mother succeeded in um, taking at least one major secret to the grave <laughs> makes me feel kind of good as the daughter that I- that You she, didn't reveal everything. That I didn't reveal everything. And, um, and I, and, and, and one of the most elusive questions in the book will remain elusive. It will remain hers. And somehow that, that just feels right to me. Um, you talked a little bit about the challenge of the mechanics of this book, mm -hmm. lots of research, mm -hmm. personal connections, many countries, um also your mom moving from place to place to place how did you even begin to organize this into a cohesive narrative oh boy that's a that's a, a kind of a complicated question um well first of all i bottom line when i started to write the book i i, I wanted to write the book like i wanted to write a story and every story has a beginning, every story has a middle, and every story has an end. And it seems like a very simple idea until you sit down and you actually start doing that. <laughs> so the other one of the thing, one of the adages that I kept leaning on was something that I read very early on, and that is just very simply, chronology is your best friend. When in doubt, just put everything, let the story play out in a chronological order. So when I, specifically when I was putting together mom's story and the, the details that I knew about the prisoner of war camp in Ukraine in 1942, then moving into Poland, out of, out of uh, Ukraine into Poland in 1943, then into Germany in 1944, I let chronology drive that. And um, and that 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 was the only way it could it could be it could go. Uh, there couldn't be any fancy flashbacks. It I it, it couldn't be like that. It couldn't. It it there was too much. It's too much to ask the reader, and um, it's unnecessary noise. So once I had that, once I nailed down that chronology to the best of my ability, then I went back and I wrote one chapter about my search. And I had intended it originally only to be the prologue, only to be 20 pages and then enough already, Roxana, shut up. We've heard enough from you. Be quiet. Let's get on with the story of Agnes Spicer. But the um, the daughter search for the mother, it just kept percolating to the surface as a as a, um, a theme that I, I it, it just it, it just it became the story. So um uh, you know, same same thing. I I mostly revealed things um, 
in the order that I discovered them, but I was less bound by phrenology on that front because the overriding narrative is my mother's story. And then I dip in and out of my research as a, my investigation as a journalist. I, th I think that's, I think that's a fair way to put it. But I think also it's the, by bringing the mother daughter story into it is what gave you the emotional hook and what makes it different from any other account that maybe we've read about whether it's, you know, war camp, war camps or, or stories right. of world war two is that this is, a, a discovering in a different way and an emotion in a different way and a way that like your mom put up roadblocks like she said so many times like why are you doing this like why can't you just let it go um and i i often think when i i think back to my grandparents i so wish i would have asked more questions and i i say that to people now often that still have their grandparents or still have right. parents like the pair their parents and they have those big stories is ask the questions they might get mad at you, but ask the questions. At least you have the opportunity to ask the questions because I was so young at the time. I was still afraid of my grandparents. <laughs> I, oh, was sure. gonna, I was not going to push them on that, right? I was raised that you, you were not like scared that they were going to hurt me, but you, there was like a reverence there. So I was never going to push them on it. Um, but you still found ways to push. What did your siblings think as you continued to, to poke and prod? Were they like yeah. keep it up or were they like, keep going no I wouldn't you know my brothers are like those classic prairie men you know of a, of a <laughs> certain whatever, gen, want, whatever of a certain generation they're quite they're quite quiet they're quite uh they keep that they're not given to great emotional um you know revelations um they also uh um you know they lived they we didn't live in the same city and um so i would say that i didn't really um i didn't really actively engage them in terms of trying to ask them questions until quite late in the process because I, because that was sort of another layer of um, family, I'm, shall I say secrets or just barriers, you know, talk about. We, yeah, we never talked about it. So, um, but, but as the um, two things happened, first of all, um, when I was doing my physical traveling through Europe, I, my twin brother was very responsive to emails and was encouraging me. And I'm very happy that I kept that correspondence and I integrated that correspondence into the book. My older brother was a lot more uh, retro, um, a lot more circumspect in what he was thinking, what he was feeling. Uh, in fact, I would say that his, um, I didn't really honestly feel that, um, I didn't know if he was approving or disapproving until very late in the research. And when I was very close to submitting the very, very last draft, he was the one, I'm talking about my older brother, Harold, who lives in Calgary, who had uh, our father's transparency collection, the, the slide collections of photographs from the 1950s and 60s. And he was the one who had said almost nothing about this uh, enterprise, but in the end, he became my most important detective because he discovered the last and most important physical clue that was the photograph of uh, mom's arm tattoo that not only put her in Auschwitz, but gave us a very specific three week time frame, and, um, dispelled any kind of uh possibility that anyone could doubt that that she that she had been there so um yeah that was a really important turning point in our relationship but also in in uh the de the detective story of, of what actually happened to mom during the second world war what was the hardest thing for you in terms of your discovery because there's a lot of you walked through a lot of places you saw a lot of things um, and a lot of it you did without your mom. Yeah, so was there, is there one particular instance that you could, that you think back to and thought, oh, that was really rough. That was a tough day. 
Oh, I I can think of half a dozen days like that. In fact, I can think of more days like that than days that weren't like that. Um, I think that one of the most chilling uh, experiences that I had, the one of the most visceral experiences that I had, um, was when I found myself in the uh, living room of a very well-respected Nazi war crimes investigator in Germany who had earlier in her career had been a senior consultant to three uh, governments, including Canada. Um, and um, I was still poking and prodding with the research, what did this mean? What did that mean? But one of the facts about mom's survival in the in the Nazi war camps could very could absolutely had to do with the fact that she could speak German, and she herself admitted, and I have her on tape saying this that that she had worked as a translator in the German camps for a period of time, and this is why, in the eyes of Stalin, her. Um, uh, her commander and the leader of Russia at that time, she would have been regarded without any question as a as a traitor. And she might not have survived at all if she'd gone back to Russia. But that's one thing to say, OK, you know, the despot of who led Russia during the Second World War would have thought my mother was a traitor. But that's one thing. But what 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 did that what did that mean to be a translator in a Nazi war camp, could that mean that could that mean that she that she was a war criminal? That question popped into my mind as I was sitting across the the table from from a professional investigator, and I I, just, I had to ask, and so I, I put it out there, and um, for, she said no 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 no, she would have been too far down the the ladder. There's no way that she would ever have been entrusted with senior level interrogations. So no, but you know, sometimes it's the, you know, you know what, you know what it's like, you know, being an on-air journalist, you know, people remember the question, they don't remember the answer. So it's like, Oh God, here we go. You know, there's, there goes, you know, Roxanne off the deep end asking if her mother might've been a, a war criminal and then, and then when I had that, so I had that material in the book and I wondered how much weight should I give it? Um, you know, is this an important turning point? What's the turning point? And I thought, well, you know, actually it speaks to, um, it speaks to my journey as a journalist and my sincerity in trying to get to the, the truth of my mother's story. So, so I did leave that in. So that was, that was definitely one big that Are you scared to ask that question, though? Because uh, we yeah, all have oh, yeah, questions. oh yeah, listen, I, we all I, have those questions where we're like, "Oh, I really don't want to ask this. Oh, well, I don't know what they're going to say, but oh, I have to ask the question." And you have to, and being that yours was so personal, you would have had to accept whatever she gave you as an answer. I know. I wouldn't say scared. I would say it was a thickening feeling that I was afraid of what she was going to say, but I, I, ha I had to ask, and. Um, so yeah, no, that was that was, and I'm and I'm really glad that I did, because another, in an interview, another interview that I had done previous to that had actually set the stage for, thinking that perhaps she might actually have been involved in much higher level, um, uh, in um, interrogations, because and so that particular interview the uh the german historian said yeah oh i think your mother would have been a very important person for the in the hierarchy of the uh of the camp and so that so that guy had already set that thinking into motion for me and i thought well if i don't rebuttal it i mean then i'll i just have to take that whole piece out and then you start messing with the journalism and that's and there's i mean i no one would have known but I would have known. And I wanted I wanted my book to stand up to the most rigorous um, lens of any, I, I just wanted it to be journalistically robust sound, uh, like that I'd really, uh, re that I'd really done everything I could to get to the truth. So yeah, so 
if I can, add, can I, if I could just go one step further with yeah. this, um, there was another point at which uh, I had a different kind of reaction. Like, oh, I wish I'd never started this. And that was the, the day, the morning uh, before dawn, I found myself with my uh, Polish interpreter standing on the original uh, cracked concrete flooring of the registration building at Auschwitz. And the, my interpreter said to me, she turned to me and she said, 100% your mother would have been in this building. And there were so many, there were so few things that any historian ever said with such certainty. Um, it immediately put such a, gave me such a chill. But then, and then because we were there before the tourists had arrived, because we, because we had early, like really early access. So it was just the two of us in the uh, registration building that had been preserved in its original, um, the original structure, you can see the original Nazi font over the doorways, the hair cutting room, the examination room, the disinfecting room. I mean, these were absolutely chilling um, things to, to see in their original Nazi font. And um, I was standing there and I felt an overwhelming desire to physically run, to get, just to get out of there. I, like it was a, it was a panic and um, like it, it was just a, it was a real adrenaline thing. And, but, but obviously I didn't. Um, and it was in that moment, Sam, that I really understood intellectually and emotionally why my mother had been silent for so many years of her life and you were there when it was safe and empty and there was not the hustle and the bustle and the the like the palpable terror that like you can feel the leftover emotion i think sometimes places carry those kind of those charged emotions and that feeling um wow. as like a sacred space it is now like a sacred space for people but you put yourselves in, in the shoes of another person of what that place would have sounded like and smelled like and everything else. And it's not surprising you wanted to get out of there. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, uh, really, um, a really astute observa observation on your part. What actually was happening in that room 75 or 80 years ago? Well, that room would have been jam packed with naked women, civilian women prisoners who um, had been marched, um, uh, forced to run approximately three kilometers to arrive at that building. They would have been um, pushed through the doorway. They were uh, hosed down with cold water by SS guards who were fully clothed, many of them smelling of alcohol. That, according to eyewitness reports, uh, survivor reports that came after the war. And... Um, the fact that there was still, uh, you know, there was still an ambiance in that in that space, yeah, it it still lingered eighty years later, and it was a very rare kind of feeling to have in Auschwitz today, because the museum itself has been really, um, the grounds, you know, they've been really dolled up, you know, you could hear industrial lawn mowers in the background. Windows are shiny, um, the, the grounds are well groomed. All of this leading one of my uh, German um, historians to say to me, look, when you go to Auschwitz, don't expect to feel anything. There isn't a whiff of what the place was. But in that particular space, in the, in the standing on that cracked concrete, that original concrete flooring, hearing our voices reverberate against the brick walls, um, no tourists around, just the two of us, uh, my my Polish interpreter and myself. I I definitely felt something. It was um, uh, it, yeah, it was it was it was that that was palpable. 
I mean, just on that very briefly, you know, this is kind of the dilemma for the museums themselves, you know, how restored should these spaces be? How far can they go and still retain some sense of the authenticity of the place? And um, there are some places that still carry the residual feelings and others like, yeah, you know, Auschwitz and two hours after that encounter with the ghosts in that room, it it's filled with school children and tourists of, of multiple languages and, and um, it's the most popular tourist site in Poland today. So it doesn't, you, you don't get that. I don't think you get the same feeling uh, when, when it's, uh, um, people are walking around hurt, hurt with their with their headphones on, and you know, taking selfies in front of the various um, signs and the barbed wire and all that. It 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 really, it it's real distraction from from what what that place actually was. There's a real, I hesitate to call it a fascination, but there is a real fascination with the Holocaust and what happened. Um, at Auschwitz uh, and and a lot of the concentration camps across uh, Europe, um, but when it's your own personal story and you take the vested interest in it, I'm just wondering, is it hard for you to talk about it and to like because there is this. You don't want to look like you're obsessed with something that's not your story to tell or that you just know everything there is to know about what happened at the in this one specific space. Do you know what I'm trying to say? That finding the balance between sharing a story, becoming obsessed with it. And then I don't even want to say a casual fan, but there are some people who know everything there is to know about that particular time period. Yeah, no, that's really, that's a great question again, Sam. Um, there's actually a whole thing called dark tourism, which yeah. deals with exactly like tra they call it trauma porn, where people yeah. go to totally the places where things yeah. have happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that really captures it. Well, uh, to that, I want to say two things. First of all, um the uh the Auschwitz story is one part of mom's story in the book and actually I when I when we were talking about the uh publicity for the book and the cover of the book and there had been a suggestion earlier uh on in the creative discussion there would be a reference to Auschwitz in uh, um on the jacket and I, I said no. I, I didn't want. I, I didn't want the book to be a story. I did, that's not. It, the book is bigger than that. You know, it's um, Auschwitz is one part of it. If that's not taking away from other books that deal with Auschwitz survivors, not at all. In fact, I I, I have great respect for all of that. But that's that's only part of Mum's story. And you know, actually, the bigger story which is even harder to comprehend is not what happened during the war, but what happened in the days and weeks after victory day, when the Soviet government itself, when Stalin declared that all of these Russian prisoners of war and these poor men and women, you know, from the ages of, of 10, 12, 14 years old, some of them, who were forced into Germany to work as slave laborers, the fact that this whole group of people stranded in Germany, five and a half million people were all branded as traitors by the mere fact that they had worked or survived the camps, whether they were slave labor camps or POW camps. So, so that, I just want to say that, so that, that was, that's actually the, the, the newer, his, the new history, the untold part of the story. And I think it's actually much more relevant to mom's um, survival story because she had to deal with the fact that the homeland that she loved, that was so much a part of her identity, was also the homeland that had declared her to be a traitor and that she was not safe for her to go back during the life of the Soviet Union. Um, so uh, um, the other thing I want to say to that that very descriptive idea of trauma porn, which really evokes a very specific kind of image. When I was when I was actually finding the voice to write the Auschwitz chapter, the two chapters, I think it is, 
I really was very studious to keep the writing to a minimum. Like, I mean, just really no hyperbole, no, no exclamation marks, just write it as a, um, really just write it in the, in the starkest way so that there'd be, so there was no exploitation of any of the, any of the emotions. You just, just let it sit there. And when you talk about, is it, when your, your original question was, is it difficult for me to talk about that part of the book? I would say not, it's not, it's, it's not quite the right question. It, it, the question, the, the, the Auschwitz chapters are actually the hardest chapters for me to read as a reader now. I, I To tell you the truth, I, I haven't gone back to actually read those chapters again since the book has been published. I, 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 I find them... Uh, they're hard. They're they're hard, very hard read for me, and if they're and they're hard, they'll be a hard read for for anybody. But but I I really tried to write it with so much um, restraint and respect and uh, and um, yeah, just just the just just to get the facts. I guess if I wanted to say. Okay, I do want to open this up to questions. We have a yeah, sorry, question. I think, you know, I, um, yeah, I'm just... No, but I, I have one, I kind of just want to talk to you about your mom in Saskatchewan because the story oh. of Jack is so heartbreaking. Oh. I did, that was a plot twist I did not expect coming. I know that's not your dad, but yeah. oh my, are you still connected to that family? Do you still have yeah. connections to them? I do, I do, and, and, um, I know, and that was another thing where I thought, you I know, didn't know I you could die in quicksand. I thought that was something from the Flintstones. Yeah, honest to God, I know. And and that was another creative choice that I made when I got to that part of the book. I said to myself, I'm not going to write about this. I'm going to. This has to. This has to be verbatim. It has to be Mum's words. It has to be exactly the way she described it. And because she too was a storyteller, very articulate, very much in command of language. I just, I, I used her exact words and she laid out the story. And I think in that it had way more impact. I am in touch with the file family. I am very pleased that they're, they, they traveled from Saskatchewan to Toronto for the book launch. I'm, yeah, I'm so excited. They're coming. Some of the family are going to be in Saskatoon next week when I'm, I'm going to be uh, doing an in-person thing. Uh, courtesy of uh, McNally Robinson on uh, in in Saskatoon, I'm really uh, really excited about that. And I think I'm going to even see some files at the files being the last name P F E I L file. Um, that some of them are coming to the uh, event in my hometown Netherhill slash Kindersley. Yes, where I will be with you next week. I can hardly uh, wait to meet you in person. You're my yeah, I mean, okay. you're amazing. <laughs> I'm going to turn this around. Okay, wait. Before I turn this around, do you guys have questions? recommend you get a raise? <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate that very much as we get into okay, I'm working on the letter. That's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> do you guys have questions before I turn the camera around? Any, does anybody have a question for her? No one has a question. I can't possibly have asked them all. Do you have a question? What's your question? Okay, okay hold on. And... There wow, go. there's, hello, Regina. Hi. Oh my God, look at all those Saskatchewanites. Okay. Saskatchewanians, you should I know I love that. you guys so much, you have no idea. <laughs> I hope you're going to come out to Kindersley and Netherhill next week. <laughs> okay. I'll see if I can make it happen. Okay, what's your question? When you were doing the narrative and you said um, today that you tried to do it chronologically, but you, I found that you were taking us along on the journey and then coming back to something that your mom had maybe said in 2012, and then you're carrying the story on, and then you're talking about a, a trip to Germany in 2017, and then you carried along, like you kept, you had introduced it and then came back to it. How hard is it to weave all of those things together? Like I was, I was just, 
would be a good word. Oh, no, thank you. Well, I think, again, you're talking about the, um, sorry, did I interrupt you? Sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, no, uh, thank you for being interested in the uh, kind of behind the scenes, how do you write a book kind of question. Um, like, honestly, uh, it's, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I don't, I, I don't want to be, I don't want, I, I don't want to be, I, I want to give you a really good answer. Um, my guiding principle was story driven. N don't lose track of the characters. Where are we? Have ultimate respect re for um, the reader. So they know, so you know, where am I now? What year is it? Where's Agnes? Where's Roxana? Like, uh, so there's a little bit of, of what we call in the TV business signposting. Um, just so, so yeah, so that was really important. And um, a lot of people are going to gloss over, you know, whether it was a piece of information that came out in 2012, 2014, 2017. It's not the most important thing, but somehow psychologically, you just feel like you're being, your hand is being held and and you're, you're not going to get lost in, in time. So, you know, some people are going to, you know, some people, it, it's just like, like, um, like literally having signs on the highway, but if you've ridden the highway long enough, you know, you don't have to, you don't need a warning sign to know that there's a curve coming up kind of thing. So I, I mean, I, I don't want to be too simplistic, but that, that, that's, I, that was the balancing act too, is just, give the reader enough to, to say, okay, I'm grounded. I know where I am. I know why I'm here and what's going to happen next. That's the thing that you really need to keep, keep working on as a, as a writer. And that's why you need a really good editor, by the way, it makes a huge difference. I mean, in the hands of a different editor, oh my God, I can't imagine. I might, I mean, we might, I don't know. I might've, I would have been lost. You know, it, it really helps to have, oh, it's, it's absolutely essential to have a good creative partner. And um, the team that I worked with at Penguin Random House, oh my God, first class, 100%. Especially Laura Hinchberger. Yay, Laura. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, Roxana. I'm uh, Janae from Kinder Sweet here. Hello, how are you? I'm good. I hope you're doing well, too. Um, one thing that I'm really struck with reading this book is kind of the idea of I know as a journalist, you've already spoken about how difficult it was to move away from the third person to the first person and, and starting to get more comfortable with introducing your own perspective and your own thoughts and feelings. And I was really struck with that, especially in the first few chapters where you talk about how you and your brothers would sometimes have different perspectives on the same memory that you share or... Right remembering things differently or even having different perspectives of, of your mom. And I was wondering how you dealt with that idea of how did your own perspective change as your story evolved? Oh yeah, no, that's a really, it's a terrific question. Um, one of the first things that I learned uh, was that nobody remembers the same thing the same way. Like you guys, you when you get up and leave tonight, none of you are going to remember this whole zoom experience the same way we can be breathing the same air looking at the same thing but we're not seeing the same thing and so um can you imagine then you know i i thought my primary witnesses would be my two brothers about what it was like to be raised by our mom and dad and then i discovered that both of those boys um like they had a completely different experience of childhood than i did and of course they're boys and i'm a girl and you know and i had my a very buddy buddy relationship with my mother right from the get go. So, um, how did I deal with that? I decided honesty is the best policy and really some of it was really raw. I mean, you know, just, but you know, but it, I, I really, I wanted it to be emotionally authentic. I, that's such a cliche, but I mean, I didn't want, I didn't want to have rose colored glasses on and paint a picture of, uh, you know, leave it to Beaver on highway number seven. It really wasn't, was it quite like that, you know? I mean, um, it, it just wasn't. And uh, 
um, but there were certainly lots of beautiful childhood memories and um, uh, but I but for sure the boys and I experienced um, growing up on the prairies quite quite differently that lesson was something that I then took into all of my it was like the same thing going back to Germany for example and actually meeting the last living eyewitness to my mother's wartime story. Here was a German lady. She was in her late eighties. I couldn't believe that she actually remembered mom, but she was a little girl living with her mom and her dad and her sister in the adjoining farm to where my mother had worked as a slave laborer, um, milking cows and and working the fields and she remembered mom at first i thought oh my god you know this little old lady you know oh, she's you know maybe she's a little bit of a crank pot you know like she just wants some publicity um but then she came up with these astonishing details that were related not to mom but to the canadian soldier that she had fallen in love with, who was Jack File that uh, Sam had referenced a few minutes or earlier. A physical detail that she couldn't have known unless she'd actually seen the guy with her own eyes and that she would still remember 80 years later. So, but again, you know, she described a childhood in Germany. We're talking Nazi Germany, guys. We're talking at the height of the Hitler years. She's describing a beautiful childhood a paradise, the most beautiful years. And th that's what she remembers. So um, anyway, so I mean, obviously I, I, I'm, I, I used all of her exact, uh, her exact recall on that too. And, and I also, by the same token, when I, when I interviewed um, um, another German lady who actually lived on the farm where my mother was working as a slave laborer, and it was her grandfather who purchased my mother as a slave for two hundred and fifty dollars, the equivalent, for the last thirteen months of the of the war. And I'm sitting there, and I'm talking to this old lady in German. I have a translator, and I'm thinking to myself, "Oh my God, does she know what I know about her grandfather? I mean, what what is the family mythology that they grew up with?" And, um, you know, and should I, should I say something? Should I put it out there? What I, what mom had told me about this guy. And, you know, if you were, if you recall from that chapter in the book, I restrained myself on that. So, um, so just to answer your question, you know, uh, how do you keep perspective and does the perspective change? I think every interview situation that you're in, you know, there's an adage, and I know Sam will know what I'm talking about when she when I say this. You read the room. What do you want from this person? And um, be open and be open and just be willing to take on whatever they say, whether you whether they they whether their recall is different than what you think, and take it at face value and and and, and take it on. And and that's why you know when I when I went when I when I met that German historian who was so flabbergasted by the the facts of Mum's story as she as I put them out there he said oh no 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 oh no 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 you got that wrong um, you know your mom she she couldn't have been in in Auschwitz and then he had suggested that maybe maybe she faked her tattoo maybe she gave herself the tattoo in order to give herself a better chance of, of emigrating. And of course my feeling was, oh, I mean, it's just like, well, I mean, I was just, I was, I was so insulted and angry, but then I thought, oh, well, I got to calm down here and I've got to think where would such a story have ever come from? Is there any weight to it? Is that even a possibility? Am I going to give that idea even some kind of heft by asking a follow-up question of another historian. So all those things I'm I'm weighing this out. And I'm so glad again, just circling back to my secret weapon called uh, Tom Weber, that um that I said, Tom, what about this? And and he gave me such a brilliant rebuttal in in like three paragraphs. And so 
I was able to dispense of that. Yeah. So I think it's just to wrap that up. When you undertake to, to tell a family story, you know, you're going to have an overwhelming urge to kind of soften the edges of it. And, and I certainly did, but also I wanted to tell, I wanted to tell the truest story that I could that would have, you know, that would resonate for not only historians, but for any kid who wants to know the, you know, who was, who were our parents before they became mom and dad? You know, I was hoping to, you know, to tap into that kind of a, kind of a universal question. Thank you. Any more questions from the room? Any questions from the Zoom crowd? If you have a question, you can just go ahead instead of raising your hand. There's not so many that it will get unruly. No questions? I don't have a question. <clears throat> I knew you would, Colleen. I, I do have a comment because this time I actually read the book. And I loved this book. I would never have picked it up. But I just thought, wow. It, and it just keeps coming back and back because wow. okay, thank it's you. this totally personal story of an individual. And you just said it's a universal story about all of us and how we're also in this big crazy stream of life where like when I think of your mother walking the wrong way to go back right oh, yeah, yeah like if you you could not have made up this story if people, <laughs> oh no that's just too much you'll have to cut this out and that because you know she's born into this world and so I was it her uncle or who got sent off to like a a camp and then her mother ended up going into a camp yeah no the whole family she marries was. at 15 to that abusive individual then she ends up in the like it's insane and then she ends up in this small town saskatchewan in the middle of nowhere and no one would know her and what i loved was then she had these children and part of the reason it seemed to me she didn't want to tell the story was she wanted you to have not be kind of tainted or saddled with it, right? Oh, very, yeah, very true. And and then I've watched some of the videos too, and she's just so, uh, it's not hilarious, but she's just adorable. In I, I, well, I thought so. <laughs> right? Right. And, um, I, I also thought all the stories of like war brides in general, all these women coming back. So I've known um, war brides and, you know, you, you, they just hear and I'm here and you never really, you just all fit in. And then you never really think of their whole story before they came or how lonely they might've been or how awful. And then her, yeah, she's got this horror story before she comes and then it continues. It's just, and I loved your choice of photos because they seemed sort of random, but they were very poignant. And just, um, I think of her in that fashion show. Oh yeah, that's one of my favorite. Right? And <laughs> oh, no just kind of doing this thing. And here's this individual who's lived through what we have seen in movies and been told by history, et cetera. Um, and there she is in small town Saskatchewan modeling this, I don't know, 1960s little dress. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know. Anyway, I absolutely loved it. And um, I think there's way more to say, but yeah, it's, it was just great. So Welcome. thank you very much. No, thanks. You. Thank you very much for that. And I, I especially appreciate you commenting on the photographs. To that, I just would like to share this with you. Um, the photographs in the book were, were the result of culling from... Um, <laughs> a number of a number of sources but uh, at one point I laid them all out on my my dining room table and there were there were close to a thousand photographs mm -hmm. and um I thought oh my god how are we going to get this down to you know two two sections and uh I again I had a lot of I had some really good advice from uh from the editors in in at, at Penguin Random House and um and I'm, I, was, I was really pleased with the way those photo inserts 
added to the story? I think mm -hmm. they add. Or do, do you feel that sometimes that if you see the photograph, it takes away from the imagination? No, not in those cases, no. Yeah. I don't think you need your imagination in this case because it's a true story. So I think that it, it helps you see who the people are. Yeah. I and need to ask, well, yeah. Sorry. Go did ahead. you have the book deal before you finished the book? Did you finish the book and pitch the book? Like you said, you, it took you eight years to get this done. What was the process of getting published like? Well, that's a big size. No, no, I really, no, it's kind of fascinating. Um, again, some really incredible serendipity. I, first of all, I don't, I, I was so lucky that, um, uh, okay, what had happened was that I, I, I had, I had, I'd gone through, I'd done a bunch of documentaries. I kept thinking I got to get back to this book about my mother, or I have to get back to the documentary about mom, or I've got to, I've got to get this thing off my, off my chest. And in the, uh, and one day I, I, I met with a former CBC colleague who actually worked at CBC in Saskatoon for a while, John McQuaker. That's before you guys were, before you were born, Sam. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> anyway, John and I worked together back in the day and um, we got together and I, he said, well, what do you really want to do? And uh, I said, well, really, I want to write this book about my mother. And he said, well, by coincidence, he had a very close relationship with the, one of Canada's leading literary agents. Uh, her name is Beverly Slopen, and he said, I'll, I'll set things up, and if, if it gels, great. So we, Be Beverly and I met, had a most extraordinary three-hour coffee, and she said, go write this book. Forget about the documentary, write the book. And I then announced to my family, okay, I'm going to take eight months to write this book. And it actually took close to eight years. So the book, I didn't want to give the literary eight, you know, the thing, you know what it's like, guys, you can, you only got one shot at it. I didn't want to show a half-baked um, uh, uh, draft. I, I, I did three full drafts. It took another two years. I did a trip back to Russia. I did a trip to Europe, back to Germany, Poland, and I wrote all that material. So I did three full rewrites before I um, before I sent the uh, draft to Beverly Slopen. At that point, she said, nah. She said, I'm lost. There are too many characters. I don't know what's going on. Like, honestly, I was sick to my stomach. And I thought, okay. And then she said to me, she was quite clear. She said, I'm only going to read this once more. So I thought I better get my act together. Like, where have I gone off the rails? And at that point, I had a couple of, I had one writer friend in particular. I'm, I referenced her earlier, uh, Kim Eklund. And um, I did another draft. I had her read it. And she was the one who said, really, you got to, you got to talk from your own perspective, bring in the detective story, bring it up higher, so that became, so that became another book. And then when I was satisfied with that, after another couple of rewrites, then uh, off it went to uh, back to Beverly. Within two hours, she said, "I want to represent this book." Within by the end of the weekend, we had another major Canadian publisher with a very attractive offer on the table. But there was a second publisher who was also interested and things went very quickly, like within days, it was like a Cinderella story. Um, and I opted finally, I know actually it was quite clear to me that I was going to go with Penguin Random House based not on the money that was uh, on the table. Um, in fact, their offer was substantially less than um, the other offer. But because I, you know, the thing I was talking about earlier, you guys, it's this intuitive trust thing. It's like this, you've got a creative partner who really gets the story. And I, I got that feeling um, immediately from the editor who um, was uh, representing Penguin Random House. I just, uh, she just really 
under she understood even before I did that I was going to be writing a mother daughter story that there was a universal theme around wanting to know who your parents were. And she had um, specifically referenced the um, the mother daughter story between my mother and her mother, which I thought was quite subtle in the book, but actually turns out to be a really important turning point in the climatic last chapter of the book. Um, but she's the one that brought me to that creatively. So yeah, and it was a joy, even though the work itself, guys, who said, you know, writing is easy. You sit at a typewriter and you just bleed. Whoever it was, I think it's Hemingway. Um, it's so true. But when you're working with a, uh, you really, with a trusted creative partner, a, a really good editor, who's, you, who know, who's really got your back, um, then it's, 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 it's joyful at, at the end. So yeah, so that, that's a long answer to your question. I probably needed an editor on the editing question. <laughs> Forgive me, you guys. I hope those chairs aren't getting too, too, too hard for you now. Um, any more last questions, comments here or from our friends on the internet? I love that you narrated it. Oh, she, liked, she said she liked the narration. I loved your mother's voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, how you did the accent, I loved your mother's voice. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You know, actually, um, thank you for mentioning that. I, I was, a, you know, there's a kind of um, uh, a got there's there's kind of a, a taboo against imitating accents in audiobooks. Um, it, a lot of people think it's a kind of disrespectful. So I and I ha had this conversation creatively with the audio audiobook team about I wanted to do my mother's voice the way I heard it in my head. Mm -hmm. And I still hear her in my head like that. And um, so thank you so much for commenting on that. It really, it really means a lot to me The the opportunity to do the audiobook was really the cherry on top of the whole process to actually read the book mm -hmm. from start to finish. <laughs> kind of forced and, you to. Yeah, it was, it was, but it was really, it really, it was a really, it was a, it was a, it was a, um, it was a finishing moment for me. I, I uh, oh, it was so emotional. The, the, when I, we got to the last, um, got to the ending, you guys will remember the the ending. It, it, it goes back to the railway platform in, in Chusavoy and my mother is now saying goodbye to her sister again. Um, in some ways that scene was the easiest scene for me to write in the sense that I had the clearest memory of it and the strongest emotional through line on it. But, um, when I read it, I got choked up and I thought, oh my God, I, I, everybody the, in the audio booth, like the technical people, they were quiet. I delivered the last line. You could hear a pin drop in the studio. Nobody came in. They left me like that for a couple of minutes. I didn't know if I was going to be able to physically get off the chair. It was so... Oh, it was so overwhelming because uh, I was there again and I was just, and I was reliving the whole thing from the time that I first started doing essays about my mother as a 10 year old kid. And it was, it had all come to this moment, this moment in this dark studio in on the 14th floor of the Penguin Random House um, corporate office. And I got up and finally walked out the door and just looked at the audio technician. The, there were three of us, we all were, in tears it was incredible you guys so i'm glad that comes through i'm, gl I'm glad that you liked it okay i have kept you well past when i said i would which is true for my course i'm not even going to pretend that i don't do that all the time <laughs> um but i so appreciate your time and the book and and everything else that has come with this, um, we call it a season launch, if you will, for the book club. Well, that's um, great. But I look forward to seeing you next week on your uh, stomping grounds. Listen, we're gonna have a hoot nanny. 
in <laughs> Nether Hill, Saskatchewan. Can you believe and... I grew up here and I've never been to Kindersley, so this is, I'm really, I'm traveling into the unknown here. Oh, you are, <laughs> listen, you're, you're going to be, uh, you're, you really you're, talked you're, it up here, so. Yeah, you're, yeah I, I'm pretty sure they're going to get you your own set of, uh, your own cowboy boots and uh, a I'm cowboy okay with hat. That. I'll fit right in. Yeah, that's right. You know, they'll, they'll get you to ride on the combine and uh, and who knows what. Of oh, course, the harvest season's over now. I think they just I think they just wrapped it up a couple of days ago. Yeah, that's great though. Well, Roxana, thank you so much for this. And thank you. And thank everybody for for being there for me and reading the book. And I, uh, it just means the world to me that we're still on the national bestsellers list. And I. I, I, I'm so proud and pleased and, th and it's because of readers like you. So thank you very much.